What more can be said about Gohan? Well, there's quite a bit. He is such an interesting character compared to the others and someone I've always enjoyed talking about. But despite being popular amongst fans, how much do people really know about him? Today, we will follow the life of Son Gohan, discuss him as a character both in conception as well as execution, and his continuing journey from boy to man to beast. Take a look at this image. This is one of my favorite pieces of art ever released that symbolizes the growth of Son Goku from child to adult, mirroring the growth of Son Gohan from child to adult. It's gorgeous, and for the past 25 years, I have adored this picture, and it perfectly represents what this video is going to be about. The life and times of Son Gohan. So let's go back to the very beginning of what we would know as Dragon Ball Z. First things first, in the original Japanese manga written and illustrated by Akira Toriyama, there is no Z. It's just called Dragon Ball from start to finish. But after Goku won the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai over Piccolo, Goku married Chi-Chi, which led us into a 5 year time skip, bringing us into Dragon Ball Manga Chapter 195, a truly historic moment in franchise history. Fun Fact! During the early adaptation process, Dragon Ball Z Episode 1 was referred to as Dragon Ball Episode 154 until they decided to add the Z to the show due to the introduction of someone who was being groomed to take on leadership role down the road, and that's Goku's son Gohan. Gohan's introduction was just one reason for the Z being added, but we'll discuss that another time. Officially, Gohan was born May 18th in age 757. His real world name pun is food related, like most Dragon Ball characters. In Japanese, Gohan refers to cooked rice or even lunch meals. This is why in the Japanese version, you will often see characters who don't know Gohan react when they hear his name as if it's lunchtime or something. This happens quite a bit. Another fun fact that very few Dragon Ball fans know is that Gohan's age was in fact changed. In the original Shonen Jump version of chapter 195 from October 4th, 1988 publication, Gohan's age was 3. In all later reprints of the manga, his age was changed to 4. It's never been stated as to why Toriyama chose to change his age. Perhaps he felt it made more sense for Gohan to be 4, maybe he just made a mistake the first time. Either way, in some English dubs, he was even aged up to be 5, but per the source material, his age was retconned from 3 to 4, so we'll go with that. From the onset, Toriyama purposely made Gohan and Goku very different characters, and it surprises me when fans try to make Gohan Goku-like and vice versa. No, this was done on purpose, and as the series progressed, we got to really figure out what that reason was, and it makes perfect sense. It's safe to say that Gohan is the co-main character of Dragon Ball Z, and that Toriyama was slowly building him up to eventually take the lead at some point, he just wasn't sure exactly when. Toriyama is a discovery writer, so he didn't meticulously plan out the details of his story, but he had an idea that at some point Gohan could take center stage, so we already had early teases and foreshadowing of this right from the very beginning. Gohan being a half-breed creates a stark difference to his father just by bloodline. Because of his mother's influence both biologically and socially, Gohan did not want to be a fighter. Gohan wanted to be a scholar. Goku has always been battle hungry and anxious to test his skills against the best because he's from a warrior race whereas Gohan has that aspect of his bloodline diluted. Gohan would be the first of many half-breeds to be introduced later. Gohan does retain some of his father's competitive spirit, but having human blood changes things. I'll go more into that later. Unlike Goku, Gohan had a relatively stable early childhood. Chi Chi kept him safe from going too far, but soon his world would come crashing down. Our first clue 
that Toriyama had plans for Gohan's future would be during the battle between Goku and Piccolo versus Goku's brother Raditz when Gohan burst out of the space pod and delivered a terrifying headbutt, injuring Raditz. Prior to the headbutt, Gohan's power level read as 1,307 on the scouter tech. This means that Gohan, when angry, was actually able to surpass Goku's entire life up until that point, and he was only four. This includes Goku's many battles at the various tournaments, Demon King Piccolo, and even 18-year-old Goku against Piccolo in the tournament final. Without a single day of training in his life, Gohan surpassed his own father. So as you remember, Goku and Raditz both die, but not before Earth was warned of the incoming threat from Nappa and Vegeta. This aspect of the half-breeds being stronger than purebloods was briefly discussed by Vegeta and Nappa when they analyzed the events of the fight and what Gohan was capable of. While half-breeds may not have the same desire for combat, the human genes allow their emotions to ignite a fire inside of them that could take a full-blooded Saiyan warrior years to reach. Because talent without training can only get you so far, Goku's mortal enemy Piccolo took it upon himself to train the boy for almost one full year. The anime version of these events had some of the best anime-only filler episodes ever and in my opinion, surpasses the manga version. During this time, we really see Gohan and Piccolo's relationship begin to blossom, with Piccolo being the ruthless trainer that he was, toughening Gohan up, the reverse happened to Piccolo as he began to form a bond with the boy because he was the first person to ever treat him with respect and dignity. Gohan's compassion for life would become a very important aspect of his character, even more so than Goku. Like Grandpa Gohan, he has a love for everyone around him, and crossing his loved ones triggers his emotion, which elevates his power. Gohan's potential has been repeatedly a recurring aspect of his character. That aforementioned potential is connected to his anger, and every time his anger explodes, it leads to a new major power-up. It's always been there from the start. Piccolo serves as the one to teach Gohan how to survive by letting him learn how to survive on his own. During this survival time, we soon discover that like his father, if Gohan stares at the moon, he can become an Uzaru, a great ape. And when this was shown early in the arc, it was foreshadowing for the finale of the arc. Gohan being left in the wilderness was his first lesson in understanding that his survival instincts and anger leads to lives being saved from threats, something that was echoed by Kami to Goku when he was a kid. I love how Toriyama always brings things back from the past in a very creative way, especially during this time when I felt that Toriyama was at his absolute peak as a writer. These events would trigger a change in Gohan, but simply put, Gohan grew up fast, this whiny, spoiled brat from these early Dragon Ball Z episodes and chapters would harden up, become a survivor, and be the key reason as to why they even survived Vegeta. <laughs> Gohan going out to the battlefield with Piccolo to confront Vegeta and Nappa was really his first true fight that he prepared for. Piccolo did his best to shape Gohan in his image, and as a result, become a father figure to Gohan. Now, I'm not going to play the game of saying he's Gohan's real dad, because he's not. But he's a strong mentor with a strong bond. And thus, Gohan remains intimidated by battle, that is, until... Piccolo sacrificed himself for Gohan in one of the most important moments in the series for both characters. This would be the moment that tapped into Gohan's anger, allowing him to fire his first true key blast ever, the Masenko to Nappa. Once again, we witness Gohan's anger fueling his power, but it was only momentary and not consistent. However, at the end of the arc, we really see the example of what he can do. After Vegeta became a great ape and crippled Goku, it was up to the team of Kudadin, Gohan, and yes, Yajirobe 
to save Goku's life. With Goku out of commission, Gohan at this point took center stage. One of my favorite moments is when Goku gave Kuririn the Genki Dama and Gohan deflected it back like a volleyball and absolutely annihilated Vegeta. Then, in the final episode of the arc, a battered and beaten Vegeta thinks he had the upper hand on the heroes, but the tables were turned on him as Gohan would transform into a great ape and absolutely smashed Vegeta. Vegeta would leave Earth, barely surviving, while Gohan was the primary reason as to why he retreated. An interesting change for Gohan began here. In a very short time, Gohan witnessed many people die right in front of him and, in a subtle way, wanted to take responsibility to go to planet Namek to resurrect the fallen warriors, especially Piccolo. Gohan at this point was driven, perhaps more than ever before. It's made clear that nothing could stop him from going to Namek, including his overprotective mother. Gohan's thrill for combat may have been a reason for this ambition, but most likely it was his desire to bring Piccolo back from the dead. The manga illustrates Gohan's disobedience to his mom because resurrecting Mr. Piccolo and the others was much more important than homework. Gohan continued to evolve into the next arc. An interesting thing happened to Gohan in the Namek Saga. He became a brave and adventuring fighter similar to Goku when he was a kid. It's here that we really see Gohan developing his heroism. One key scene in particular is when he was hiding by a cliff as Frieza and his minions overtake a Namekian village and murder innocent Namekians. Gohan watches this and of course it triggers that interior anger seeing innocent people killed. At one point, Dende's life was threatened and Gohan, knowing he may be outmatched, got involved and dove in for the save. I absolutely love when Gohan jumped in and kicked Dodoria in the face to save Dende. Dende would lead them to Saichoro, the Grand Elder of Planet Namek, who would unlock Gohan's latent potential and give him a power boost. Toriyama wrote this into the story because he wanted to make it a bit more realistic that Gohan and later Kuridin could compete in battle with Frieza's minions. This would be the first of two times Gohan's latent potential was unlocked. We'll go into the other one later. Gohan begins to take a more serious role in the combat, little by little, namely when the Ginyu Special Forces arrive. The bravest thing he's ever done up until this point is attempt to defeat Rakum, who was an absolute tank around this time. Gohan's valor and resilient behavior was put to the test, but ultimately he could not overcome Rakum and got his neck broken as a result. This was one of the most graphic moments in DBZ. Let's not forget, this is a five-year-old kid getting his neck broken. Damn. At this point, Gohan was faced with death for the first time in the series until Goku showed up just in time and gave him a senzu to save his life. From this point forward, the arc would shift to Goku being the lead with Gohan being a supporting character. They team up with Vegeta and later Piccolo to take on Frieza himself. While Gohan was involved in the fight, ultimately Frieza was too much for any of them. Gohan continued his supporting role, showing off his latent power and even being able to hit third form Frieza with a tremendous attack. But once Goku appears, he kind of takes the center stage again with Gohan going back to being support, helping as much as he could but ultimately, it would come down to Goku versus Frieza on the dying planet when Gohan and everybody else on planet Namek, other than Goku and Frieza, were teleported to Earth. For more information and an in-depth analysis on Goku versus Frieza, check out my Dragon Ball in-depth on the brilliance of that fight. I promise you'll enjoy it. Gohan's growth from the beginning of the series up until now has been stellar, both mentally and physically. Even though he's still a kid, Gohan kind of became his own man here. The anime gave us an extra, 
the Garlic Jr. arc. This was specifically made to give Gohan a W over a major villain. Gohan and Piccolo are the leads of this arc, and Gohan shows how potent his power is by vanquishing Garlic Jr. for a second time. Speaking of Garlic Jr., Gohan's role in the classic DBZ movies would mostly be as a supporting character, with a few notable exceptions. With DBZ Movie 1, he was the one who defeated Garlic Jr. and pushed him into his own dead zone. And in DBZ Movie 9, Gohan would annihilate Bojack, and then he would face off against Broly in DBZ Movie 10, and was able to overcome him with the infamous family Kamehameha. Of course, he would once again be the lead in Dragon Ball Super Super Hero, but we'll discuss that later. When it comes to the main series, the artificial human arc, aka the Cell arc, would be when Gohan would truly ascend to main character status. During the early portions of the arc, Gohan showed more of that bravery that we saw flashes of all throughout the Frieza saga. Once the Z fighters get the bad news from Trunks about the future, Gohan and the others knew they had to train hard and Gohan got a special opportunity to train with both his father and his surrogate father figure as depicted in Dragon Ball Z episode 124 when Gohan trains with Piccolo and Goku. It was almost a dream come true for him as it elevated his strength going into the confrontation with 19 and 20. Side note. If you want to learn everything there is to know about the androids, aka artificial humans, I have an hour-long Dragon Ball in-depth video packed with so much information that you absolutely must check it out. We cover androids 1 all the way to 21, so go check that out if you haven't. So, during this part of the story, there wasn't much for him to do, and this is likely because Toriyama was saving him for a greater purpose later in the arc. Little did we know how great this purpose would be. Once Goku awoke from the heart virus attack, he got together with Gohan, Trunks, and Vegeta and discussed surpassing their limitations which began with them training in the Room of Spirit and Time. This is a room located in the heavenly realm that exists in an alternate realm where time moves slower and one full year inside equates to one day in the normal universe. Vegeta and Trunks entered first, followed by Gohan and Goku. This one year of training may have been the most important time in Gohan's life, or at least since the time he was on his own training with Piccolo. Meanwhile, outside the Room of Spirit and Time, the enemy known as Cell appeared and was slowly gaining in power by absorbing others. Goku and Gohan knew they faced a serious looming threat and had to evolve stronger than they'd ever been before to win. Side note, I also did a deep dive into the history of Cell on a Dragon Ball in depth, so check that out too because these videos complement each other and this one as well, because the destinies of these characters are forever tied. I'm talking about Gohan and Cell. During the training with Goku, Gohan is finally able to become a Super Saiyan. This is portrayed in Dragon Ball Manga Chapter 382, which correlates with Dragon Ball Z Episode 160. I find it fascinating that Toriyama booked this arc and the journey of Gohan and Cell to mirror each other. Gohan finally got his transformation while at the same time Cell absorbed 18 to achieve his perfect form. This was purposely done as Toriyama knew in the back of his head that he would build these two up to clash at the end of the arc and it was one of the best buildups in the manga. Toriyama is one of the all time greats when it comes to promoting and building up big fights. When Gohan transformed in the Room of Spirit and Time while training with Goku, he had to use the same exact internal rage and tap into that to achieve the form. The same rage used to give him a boost in power in earlier fights. Goku states that his method of achieving this form is rage, but also intense training. One of my least favorite lines in the English dub is when Goku says it comes from a need, not a desire. That's false. That's 
more English dub nonsense and nowhere to be found in the Japanese anime or the manga. And it also contradicts the truth about how to get stronger. Gohan had to learn how to stay in a consistent state of anger as opposed to just a small burst of rage when one of his friends are in danger. Vegeta himself told 19 earlier in the arc that he feels more aggressive when in the transformed state. While training together, Goku realizes that Gohan has even more internal power and potential than the average fighter. You see, mastering this anger and controlling it is the key to truly unlock the max levels of the power. But Goku knew that Gohan was special because he was more emotionally toned than he or Vegeta. This is of course, as I mentioned, because he's half human. So because of this, he was able to truly rely on his rage to take him to the next level. Gohan being half human gives him a much larger emotional spectrum, which is the big reason as to why it took Goku and Vegeta longer to tap into SS2. Firstly, Goku and Gohan learned that the intermediate grades have too many flaws. Goku demonstrates this while Trunks simultaneously is humiliated by Perfect Cell in their fight because Cell very quickly realized the flaws of Super Saiyan Grade 3. Maybe it's because he has Goku and Vegeta's cells and thus he's a cunning warrior. But soon after, Goku being the fighting genius that he is, teaches Gohan that this was not the way. They needed to figure out how to stay in the transformed state while not powered up, callousing their body to get accustomed to being in the form without getting into a fight. This will then make it easier to reach higher levels of power when powering up, which is the foundation for the future. This is known as full power super Saiyan, a form I cover in extreme detail in the Transformation Guide series on the Geekdom 101 channel along with all the other forms in the series. After a year of training, Goku set Gohan up to become greater than he ever had been before. <music> Goku and Gohan emerged from the Ruma Spirit in time stronger than any of the Z fighters including Trunks and Vegeta. Vegeta in particular marveled at Goku's genius for figuring out how to properly stay in the form without powering up. He understood the principles behind Goku's strategy. At this point on Goku's orders, the pair rested in preparation for the Cell Games. This entire time, Goku had a plan that he kept close to him and didn't tell anybody else including the audience. Little would we know that Goku believed in Gohan so much that he knew not only had Gohan surpassed Goku despite being just a child, but that he would have the best chance to defeat Cell. Goku believed in Gohan more than Gohan even believed in himself. And thus, Goku was the first challenger to take on Cell in the Cell games. Well, the first real challenger because we all know what happened to that Mr. Satan guy. From the onset, Goku wanted to test himself against Cell, but he suddenly knew he probably wasn't going to be able to beat him. Goku fought Cell to the best of his abilities, and it remains one of the best fights in the entire series. Eventually, Goku realizes that even he at maximum power was no match for Cell, and remember, Cell wasn't even close to tapping into his full power. Goku surrenders and passes the baton to Gohan. This moment right here is one of the most important because it's the only time where Goku passes the proverbial torch to his son, silently proclaiming him as the next hero of Earth. This moment served as not only an in-universe passing of the torch, but also a subtle real-life passing as Toriyama's long-term plan seemed to have finally come about. We find out that Goku suspected the entire time he could not win, but he fought Cell first for the purpose of allowing Gohan to observe the fight to study Cell's movements. To me, this evens the playing field because Cell is composed of the cells of many other fighters, so why not give Gohan the chance to study and learn? Goku gives Cell a Senzu to bring him back to full strength. This is one of the most criticized moments in the series, and I understand why. 
Using real world logic, there's no way a parent would ever do that. Goku was so overconfident in the hidden powers of his son that he was willing to gamble everything on Gohan. Perhaps foolishly so, including allowing their enemy to get back to full strength. Like I said, Goku believed in Gohan even more than the boy believed in himself and thought even with Cell at full power, he would be no chance for Gohan. When Son Gohan stepped up against Cell, Cell thought it was a joke. Gohan did the best he could for that form, but Cell never really took him seriously. At one point, Gohan warned Cell about his rage and how it gives him power. Cell, being the bonehead egotist like Vegeta was back then, decided to continue to aggravate Gohan. When a sign at the zoo says, do not feed the bears, and you feed the bears and lose an arm, that's your fault. And unlike Cell, you can't just grow it back. I hope you understand the metaphor there. At this point, Cell got more aggressive, taunting Gohan about the impending doom that is coming if he doesn't take the fight seriously. I always love how Vegeta's uncontrollable ego is what allowed Cell to become perfect, and now Cell himself does the exact same thing with Gohan. Cell couldn't imagine that Gohan, even angry, would be able to truly lay a finger on him. The ego will play tricks on you, and Cell's is beyond anybody else up until this point. Cell tortured Gohan's friends and threatened to kill them by creating seven Cell Juniors to inflict pain on the others. Gohan was getting madder and madder, but it still wasn't enough. Gohan did not want to fight. While Gohan's competitive side is there, he's nowhere near as involved or perhaps obsessed with combat as his father is. It took a speech from Artificial Human 16 to Gohan for him to really understand. 16 implored with Gohan that there are people in this world that you cannot reason with. Cell is a narcissist. He does not care about other life forms besides himself and those he can use. He only uses people for ego fuel or at times literal fuel. 16 explained to Gohan, who is a kindred spirit, that if he really wanted to protect all life forms on Earth, he needed to stand up and fight Cell because Cell is the kind of guy who will absolutely not listen. All it took was his head being crushed right after by Cell for it to be enough as Cell sealed his fate once and for all. Big mistake, champ. Big mistake. As I explained in my video explaining SS2 Gohan, this scene is often misunderstood. Gohan wasn't angry just because 16 was killed by Cell. That was only part of it. Gohan was truly angry because of what 16 represented. Gohan was angry because his friends and family were in danger of being killed by Cell Juniors. Gohan was angry because he realized he needed to be. And, as 16 explained, some people just can't be reasoned with. Cell's character is that of a major narcissist. It's almost impossible for a narcissist to change who they are or to listen to any form of criticism, both in the real world and in the world of Dragon Ball. They have no empathy. Cell has no empathy and Gohan is the embodiment of empathy. So Toriyama was positioning this fight to be a bit deeper than you may realize just by looking at it from beneath the surface. At full power Super Saiyan, Gohan was apprehensive of fighting because he knew how dangerous he was and didn't particularly enjoy getting angry. But once he was pushed to go further beyond, much like when he first transformed, his excitement to fight increased. He never quite got to the levels of his father or Vegeta when it comes to enjoyment of combat, but it certainly got his alien blood boiling. At this point, Gohan seemed unbeatable as he tore through Cell chapter after chapter, episode after episode. Cell tried everything, digging into his bag of tricks 
and coming up empty-handed every time. Cell even powered up to his absolute maximum power and was still helpless. Cell hid his true power from even Goku, and Goku himself was amazed at Gohan's power, even though he was truly the only one who believed in him. When Cell mimicked Trunks' grade 3 form and turned giant, Gohan landed a hit into Cell's stomach, which caused him to puke out 18. At this point, Cell was finished, reverting to his second form. Gohan was then urged to finish off Cell, but Gohan lets his alien blood brain rot take over and chose to continue punishing Cell rather than just blowing him away so we can all go home. He wanted to toy with Cell, making the same mistake that all other villains do. Succumbing to the ego is a common trait among people, and it doesn't really make Gohan a bad guy, but this is the fate of the world here. Maybe he should have listened to his father and Piccolo and everyone else. As a result of Gohan's actions, Cell begins to self-destruct, which leads to Goku sacrificing himself to protect the planet. But, as many will remember, Cell was able to regenerate and attain a form beyond perfection, commonly known as Super Perfect Cell. This power-up was dangerous and was able to crush Gohan's arm. With Gohan having one arm disabled and Goku being dead, all hope seemed lost. That is, until Goku spoke to Gohan from beyond the grave and gave him encouragement. Goku's words were powerful, and the revelation that we still have not seen the absolute max power of Gohan was even surprising to Gohan himself. Goku revealed during this time that Gohan was afraid of unleashing all of his power because of the earth falling apart and Gohan's fear of that, but Goku assured him it would be okay. Quite frankly, Cell's Super Kamehameha would have destroyed the earth anyways had it struck, so Gohan would have had to have taken the risk to fight back despite his reservations. In this case, the risk paid off and Gohan was able to finish off Cell once and for all. And before you say, well, Vegeta's the real reason Gohan did it, you probably need to watch my video about the power of SS2 and by the end of it, you'll understand Vegeta had a very small part to play and it was Gohan's might, which was way stronger than fans even realize the real reason as to why Cell was defeated. At this point, Goku chose to stay dead to prevent more problems from coming and left Gohan as the Earth's protector. This would have been a very good point to end the series, and in fact, many Dragon Ball fans think it was supposed to end here, but that's a myth that is untrue. Instead, Toriyama hit the fast forward button in his storytelling and moved ahead seven years in the timeline, and here, we pick up with Gohan being a young adult, meeting new people, and facing a slew of new problems. Toriyama did intend for a long time to transition from Goku to Gohan as the role of main character and popularity polls in the various Jump magazines of the time listed Gohan as being one of the most popular characters in manga. So in the next arc, Toriyama aged Gohan up but also gave Gohan a little brother, Son Goten, a new character slotted to take the role that Gohan had in the series prior to this arc as the child co-star. This was a common strategy in shonen franchises, but it also gave Gohan a new kind of relationship and a new person to care for and fight alongside. Also introduced in the Boo arc was a love interest for Gohan, the daughter of Mr. Satan, Videl. Mr. Satan was the phony who took credit for being the one to kill Cell, even though it was Gohan who did it. The idea that Satan screwed Gohan and Gohan later literally screwed Videl makes me laugh. Gohan having a love interest and a little brother allowed Toriyama to explore new avenues of storytelling. However, Toriyama himself has admitted that he's not very good at writing romance. This is why a lot of the relationships in the series are explored off screen, even in the manga. Of all couples in the Dragon Ball series, it feels like Gohan and Videl are the closest to actually showing romance while still not going too far as to show physical affection. Toriyama subtly shows them getting closer and the anime filler illustrates that even more. 
Unlike her father, who's a counterfeit hero, Videl is a tough martial artist, and naturally, her respect for the actual man who killed Cell is what drives her attraction to Gohan, besides, of course, his good and positive nature. Even as an adult, Gohan remains innocent, but he's not perfect. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Gohan's life became more humble at this point. Rather than defending the Earth from aliens or demons or killer cyborgs, he transitioned into becoming a crime fighter, the Great Saiyaman. Was it corny? Yeah, but it was supposed to be. Toriyama wrote this aspect of Gohan's character to not only mimic the Ginyu Special Forces, but in turn, inspired by the same thing they were inspired by, Japanese tokusatsu television shows. TV shows like Ultraman, Kamen Rider, and Super Sentai with their wacky poses and colorful costumes, have been a staple of Japanese television for decades. Toriyama was inspired by these shows as a younger man, and that's why Gohan acts the way he does. We find out rather early on that Gohan slacked off in his training, and thus, that hunger and that rage, that incredible strength that he showed in the Cell Saga was tamed. Vegeta and Goku both scolded him, in different ways, very much disappointed that he was a shell of his former self. He was still powerful enough to transform, but ultimately was surpassed by Goku and Vegeta during the seven year time skip. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly why Toriyama wrote Gohan like this at the time. Obviously the big difference between Gohan and Vegeta and Goku is that he was a half-breed and they are purebloods. Gohan had that humanistic side to him, and thus, he never had the obsession with combat that the purebloods had. Toriyama was clever with this aspect of the story as it harkened all the way to the early days of the Z portion when half-breeds were said to have more potential for faster growth. However, their thirst for combat was minimal compared to the purebloods. When rereading the Boo arc now as an adult, I think not only was this the intention, but also I think Toriyama was trying to deconstruct Gohan and then rebuild him. Perhaps I'm too optimistic in my approach, but Gohan's training with the Kaioshin and the eventual power-up he got from the old Kaioshin was his way of rebounding him. However, if that were true, it does sort of feel like it wasn't earned. Up until this point, Goku and Vegeta were consistently training to improve. Meanwhile, Gohan surpasses both of them by letting an old man cast a spell on him. It's a bit weird and one of the weaker aspects of the writing in this arc, even if it did lead to Ultimate Gohan being the ultimate badass. But even the ultimate badass got punked out when Majin Buu absorbed Gotenks and Piccolo. Even with all of these godly upgrades, Gohan was humiliated by this version of Boo. Then, let's not forget he couldn't catch the Potara that his dad threw at him. Was Toriyama burying this guy on purpose? The middle to final portion of the Boo arc finds Gohan sitting out most of the time, either with the Kais absorbed by Majin Buu, or just on Earth while Goku and Vegeta battle Buu on the Kaioshin planet. It's difficult to pinpoint the exact moment that Toriyama chose to go back to Goku as the lead and abandon his original idea of Gohan taking over, but if I were to guess, it would be right after Ultimate Gohan beat down Super Buu. The writing at this point starts to feel like it's dragging, almost like the creator couldn't really figure out how to end the arc. So it's been a multi-decade long myth that Gohan was replaced by Goku as main character because of fan outcry. Complete nonsense that has never been proven. On the contrary, there's tons of evidence against that, and I've done a Mythbusters video on this channel compiling all of it. So check that out for all the evidence proving that that's not what happened. The only reason given as to why Toriyama went back to Goku as main character is because he felt Goku was better suited. Those are his words. Perhaps because Goku represents the classic Taoist martial artist, always seeking adventure and new challenges along the way. 
Perhaps for Toriyama, it was easier to write stories with Goku than Gohan. It really wouldn't matter because after the Buu Saga, Toriyama was pretty much done with the weekly manga and closed the book on the story with the appearance of Gohan and Videl's daughter Pan being introduced, the result of their romance. At this point, Gohan was happily married and a father, which to me is a pretty satisfying ending for the character. Others may not agree, but that's how I see it. However, just because the original story from Toriyama ended, that didn't mean we were done with Gohan or Hell, even done with Dragon Ball. More in the next section. Let's discuss Gohan's portrayal in GT and in Super. Even though the original Dragon Ball manga came to an end in 1995, the Dragon Ball franchise continued anime only with Dragon Ball GT. With Dragon Ball GT, Toriyama retired from writing the manga and GT was a continuation of the Dragon Ball Z anime and although Toriyama was involved in producing the early GT stuff, it would be Toei Animation whom would decide the direction of the story. And that direction of the show would shift not to focusing on Gohan, but his daughter Pan and her relationship with her grandpa Goku. She takes the role of the co-star in GT, replacing even Vegeta in that role for a lot of the story. Most Gohan fans I've spoken to throughout the years do not like how Toei wrote Gohan in GT. He basically did almost nothing. Or at least nothing truly earth shattering. Yeah, I liked his fight with Goten when he was possessed by Baby and his fight with Vegeta. But what did he really do? I guess he helped power up SS4 Goku. And he helps evacuate the earth and fight the shadow dragons a little bit. And uh, yeah, there was nothing for him. He was demoted to being a background character or a supporting character. And that's about it at best. Now, when it comes to the Dragon Ball Renaissance era, starting with Battle of Gods in 2013, Gohan definitely did more than in GT, but for the majority of the run of Dragon Ball Super, Gohan's major antagonist was not Cell or Bojack, it was inconsistent writing. If you analyze how Gohan is written in these stories, you can tell it's off. Toriyama had a hand in writing a lot of the stories in Super, and straight up wrote the full script for Resurrection F, Broly, and Super Hero, starting with Resurrection F, Toriyama lazily reused the trope from the Boo arc. Gohan slacked off and has gotten weaker. Frieza, however, did the opposite, and one-shotted Gohan in his first form in the movie version of Resurrection F. This would begin a strange series of events where Dragon Ball Super couldn't figure out what to do with Gohan. While Super teased at various times that Gohan could be the strongest once again, they never really kept focus on that. If you look at the things Gohan said and the way he behaved in the future Trunks arc, he seemed to be happy with his life and really didn't have motivation to fight. But then, in the very next arc, the Tournament of Power, Gohan seems to be refocused and re-energized to fight. One of my favorite DBS episodes of the anime is when he faced off against Goku at night prior to the tournament beginning. This was phenomenal and gave me hope that Gohan would be taken seriously again. Now during the tournament, the anime and manga versions differed. In the anime, Gohan had some shine here and there, but in the manga version written by Toyotaro, Gohan was seriously pushed. There was an entire manga chapter where Gohan dominated and was shown to be an absolute beast, no pun intended of course. Gohan went back to being a supporting character in the Moro arc and he wasn't even in the Granola arc at all. But when the time came for Dragon Ball Super Super Hero, the next movie from 2022, Gohan fans got what they wanted for years. But that wasn't the original idea. When Toriyama was first conceiving the next movie, after Broly, he pictured it as a movie centered around Piccolo as the lead, something the series had never done before. 
Dragon Room Head and Shueisha Editor Akio Iyoku, who worked alongside Toriyama as his right-hand man for years, suggested that Gohan be put in there as the star alongside Piccolo and Toriyama agreed. There had been data gathered for years about the popularity of Gohan, not just in Japan, but everywhere in the world. And that's what led to the choice to not only feature Gohan, but bring him back into prominence by giving him a new transformation. Toriyama was quick to state shortly after the movie came out in Japan that Gohan Beast is the strongest in the series. Of course, that's all hyperbole to promote the movie and can be debated, but you can't debate the fact that the movie does give Gohan a new lease on life as a top character. The story they told was similar to the one told in Z, except that Gohan was privately training and learning new techniques, but meanwhile Piccolo was trying to get Gohan's fighting spirit back, and by the end, his near death is what triggered Gohan in a scene that was an homage to Gohan's ascension in Dragon Ball Z against Cell. One aspect of Gohan's character that many fans, including myself, wanted them to touch upon, but was mostly ignored in Dragon Ball Super until Superhero was his connection to his loved ones. We've said for years that if Videl or Pan were ever put in danger, that it would be the perfect trigger point for Gohan to go back to taking things seriously. Unlike his father, Gohan's human side created an attachment to living creatures and loved ones, perhaps even more than Goku. This is why the scene with 16 impacted Gohan so much. With Dragon Ball Super Superhero, Pan pretends to be in danger due to Piccolo's suggestion, allowing Gohan to get serious, but it's not until the climax of the film when Piccolo appears to be dead at the hands of Cell Max that pushed Gohan to become Beast. Will this focus on Gohan continue as Dragon Ball goes forward, or will the creative minds behind the series remove the focus again? Time will tell, but I think Gohan fans are tired of being jerked around and want Gohan to stay as relevant as possible as long as possible, and at least Dragon Ball Super Superhero seems to be a sign of Gohan going in the right direction. Gohan has always been a character fans can relate to. A kid whose father sees more in him than even he does, a half-breed with access to power that even he can't truly conceptualize, a hero, a character who bounces between being a powerful force of good and a scholar, who enjoys studying and learning even more than he does beating people up. Gohan has had one hell of a life, and as it stands right now, his story is ever unfolding. I'm sure we will all watch with bated breath as Gohan lives on. Thank you for watching.